Welcome back to my AFM lessons. The first 18 lessons were on the fundamentals of atomic force microscopy, meant to get you started imaging the most basic mode of AFM, and to give you a foundation in which to understand all forms of scanning probe microscopes. Here in lesson 19 and subsequent lessons, we'll talk about force curves and their interpretation. We'll go into a deeper level of detail. So first of all, what do I mean by force curves? Well, you stop imaging, you stop the raster motion in X and Y, and instead you bring the tip and sample together by changing the height of the scanner in Z, and you watch the subsequent deflection of the cantilever, which is proportional to the force. So, interestingly, the force curves, which, by the way, tell you about the surface forces acting between the tip and the sample, and the materials properties of the tip and the sample, force curves tend to have two basic shapes. One shape looks like this. And you would get this more or less when you are loading the sample, i.e. decreasing the distance between the tip and the sample, and when you're unloading, increasing the distance between the tip and the sample. The other basic shape, again we have axes force is a function of scanner position. The other basic shape is you reduce the distance between the tip and the sample, nothing much happens, and then there's a dramatic jump, and then you load up, and then you separate, and then you pull and pull and pull, and finally there's a separation, and the data look very different. So I want to explain in this lesson the origin of the difference between the shapes. And I'm also going to show you a video of this behavior on a macro scale so you can see exactly what I mean. Here I have a macroscopic cantilever with a magnetized tip near a magnet. At the moment the cantilever is stiff because its length is short, I'm holding it near the tip. Look what happens when I approach and retract. Cantilever bends forward a little bit, but there's nothing dramatic going on. Now I'll lengthen the cantilever, making it weak, weaker, and look. There are instabilities, or jumps, in the cantilever. And as I approach, there's a small jump, jump and as I retract, there's a big jump. So approach and retraction are not the same. That's called hysteresis. And these two behaviors that I just showed you are re represented by those force curves I just sketched. In order to understand the difference between those basic shapes, we need to review potentials. I want you to be able to read a potential diagram and understand what it means. Let's start with a very simple potential, the potential for a spring, which is one-half kx squared. Okay, that's just a quadratic centered around the origin. Now the force associated with that is the negative derivative of the potential so that is equal to minus kx, a line like this. Okay, there is a special point on each of these plots, right here and right here, where the slope of the potential diagram is zero and where the force is zero. You might remember when forces are zero, that is equilibrium. That means there's no acceleration. Okay, why is that important? 
turns out there are three types of equilibria. If we take a potential that looks like this, and we're looking for the flat spots on it, we would say this is equilibrium, this is equilibrium, and this is equilibrium. It's not where u itself is zero, it's where the slope is zero. If we sketch the force, remembering that it's the negative derivative, well, directly underneath this flat spot, the force would be zero. Directly underneath the second equilibrium there, the force would be zero. And the force would be zero here in that long flat spot. So the force is the negative slope. And on the left-hand side of that upper right plot, we've got a negative slope for the potential. That means force is positive from here to here. Between the two small equilibria, we've got a positive slope of the potential. That's a negative force. Between the second equilibrium and the long flat equilibrium, we've got a negative slope. So we've got a positive force. We see the equilibria on the force diagrams, here and here, where force is zero. Turns out these equilibria are not the same. If we imagine a ball rolling on the potential diagram, what what would happen near each of these equilibria? Here, in this one, if the ball is displaced a little bit, well, that says a positive force, so it will return towards the center. And likewise here, that is a negative force, so likewise it will return that way. That means this equilibrium is a stable equilibrium where if something is displaced it moves back. So oscillatory mo motion is possible here. In contrast, if you imagine a ball there rolling on this equilibrium, then this position here corresponds to a negative force. If it's displaced from the very top, it's just going to continue to go away. Likewise here. And here, in this flat spot, nothing much happens. This one is called unstable. This one is called neutral. The net result is that you can read potential diagrams like topographic maps. In, you have valleys, valleys are stable, and hills that are unstable, and plains that are neutral. So you look at a potential diagram and you just imagine there's a ball in a valley or a hill. Now let's apply this thinking to a force curve. Here I've sketched potential as a function of the z position of the scanner. I've already sketched a quadratic potential representing the cantilever, same function as a spring, one half k deflection squared. And now my sketch of the tip sample interaction looks like this. The negative parts are associated with attractive forces and the positive parts with repulsive ones. We'll be talking more about this sort of thing later. Here, we just want you to get the basic idea of shapes of force curves. So I'm going to draw three of these corresponding to near, mildly far away and far away um, from, from the, uh, the, the cantilever. So the nice thing about potentials is that they just add. In the language of physics and mathematics, they're just uh, scalars. And starting with the tip sample interaction that's far away, well, on this scale, 
when we add them, actually we don't see anything. Uh, the, the cantilever potential is, is basically all that we see. About the middle one, what happens is down here the cantilever potential is unperturbed, but then here we get a little hiccup there in the potential, and here the tip and sample are so close together that the potential is dominated by the interaction between the tip and the sample. So if we represent the tip as a ball sitting in this potential, as we're bringing the cantilever in, uh, the uh, tip and sample together, nothing much happens until suddenly the tip and sample are close enough together such this, that this ball is accelerated down into the minimum of the potential and then it sits there as we pull it out it sits in this potential until it gets here and one step further away and that little ledge there disappears and this goes rocketing back towards the center. So those two arrows that I have just repre um, drawn represent instabilities And you see they occur at different positions. The one on the left, when tip and sample are close, the one on the right, when they're far away. So that gives rise to this shape of force curve. Now I've added a sketch on the bottom half where the tip sample interactions are all the same but I've changed the cantilever stiffness to be much greater. So that K normal has increased. So when I add potentials, when I add the cantilever potential to the far tip sample interaction in this region, uh, nothing has changed. And likewise, for the middle, the middle interaction, nothing changes over the range of the cantilever. And for this close one, I don't get the full effect of the tip sample interaction because the potential for the cantilever is stiff. So what happens is instead of the, our ball in equilibrium here suddenly jumping into that uh, potential well uh, and accelerating, it remains in equilibrium all the way through, and here would represent its position when the tip sample interaction is, is where I've sketched it here on the left. So the, there'd be like a succession of changes that, that look like this, and that ball would remain in equilibrium uh, the whole time. So this gives rise to force curves that look like this. In summary, there are two basic shapes of force curves. The one on the left is for when the cantilever is stiff or the normal spring constant is high. The one on the right is for when the cantilever is weak or the spring constant is low. So I've drawn these for the same tip sample interaction having only changed the cantilever. So you can see those shapes are completely different for the same tip sample interaction. In the next lesson, we'll talk about how to process these data so you can get as much information out of them as possible.